Hello, this is Pastor David. Welcome to the Community Church Podcast. We believe that God moves powerfully anytime his word is shared. So even now in this moment, we're praying that this message will find its way into your heart, your soul, and your mind, that you'd be receptive not only to what God has said through his scriptures, but also to what God is saying here and now through his spirit. So welcome once again. Thanks for tuning in. We hope to see you on a Sunday. But if you're unable to make it and you still want to partner with us financially, you can do so by visiting community-church.com forward slash give. Thanks so much for leading us in worship. Um, so many of those things that we've been singing this morning are, are uh, things that we're going to be talking about, things that we're going to be looking at this morning. And we are uh, in, in a series called On the Water. And um, one of the things that, that we uh, as a teaching team did is we, we, um, we, we a couple of years ago, we did this series called On the Water. And we looked at uh, these men and women of faith throughout Scripture. And so when, when I say uh, people of faith, who do you think of in Scripture? Noah, right? Who Abraham. Moses, right? We, like, listen, we, when we think of people of faith, we go to, like, Hebrews chapter 11, and we start thinking about all these, like, superheroes. I mean, these, these people who, who did s- such amazing things, and God used them in such significant ways, and, and, and what we decided to do is we want to do a series uh, called On the Water Again, and we want to look at some of the unsung heroes of the faith, people that we don't really talk about much, or maybe we don't even know that they're in Scripture, and, and so last week, Pastor Allen did Naaman and, and how Naaman had leprosy and he came to Elisha and, and, and uh, he was like, hey, you need to heal me. And, and Elisha sends out a servant, right? He sends a little sticky note, right? And he's like, hey, listen, that's like breaking up in a text message, right? He's like, hey, listen, uh, just go dip in the water. And, and Naaman gets angry. He gets frustrated because, because why? Because God didn't do it the way he expected. Sometimes that happens with us, isn't it? And... Um, and so yesterday, I was, I was out at Life Fest. Um, anybody out at Life Fest? Life Festers? Life Festies? What's, I don't know. Anybody been to Life Fest? Okay. Um, and so I'm out at Life Fest and, and uh, sitting at the CSM tent, and, um, and this girl asked, hey, Pastor Carl, are you, you preaching at, uh, are you preaching at church tomorrow? I said, yeah, I'm preaching. And she's like, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on the midwives in Exodus. Exodus chapter 1. And she looked at me, and she's like, what? It's like... Like, like I was lying to her about what I was preaching about. She's like, That's not even, that can't even be a story. And I'm like, no, it is. And, um, and so we're going to look this morning in Exodus chapter 1. If you have a Bible, open up to Exodus chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, and uh, our ushers can get you a copy of God's Word. We want you to engage this morning uh, with God's Word. We believe that it's living and active. And, and even when it's stories of people that we've never heard of, God still wants to teach us something. God wants us to see something uh, about who he is and about who we are. And, and he wants us to change. He wants us to leave here the, the, today different than when we came in. And, uh, and so I want you to look at something for a second. Check this out. Anybody ever see this before? Anybody? In the first service, somebody was like, yes! I was like, you're a little too excited about Connect the Dots. Um, and uh, can you tell me what that is? What's that shape? Liam. Liam, you know what that is, right? Your dad might not. Just kidding. Pastor Drew and I, we went on a Boundary Waters trip a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, Pastor Drew didn't catch one fish. So some of y'all need to take him out fishing. Uh, so, so anyway, so it's a fish, right? So we see that, though even though it's a connected dots, like we already see the picture. And, and so sometimes God works like this. Sometimes God shows us and, and he kind of gives us a, a picture of like where he's going and what he's doing. But more often than not, I don't know about you, but my experience with God is more like this. Right? You know what I'm saying? And don't listen, don't come up after church and be like, I could see the picture. Okay, no, you can't. All right? So, so here's the thing, right? Sometimes when we're following God, we're like, God, where are you going? God, where, where is all this leading? God, what, what are you doing? Where is the big picture? Like, let me see what you're doing. And God's like, no, listen, I don't want you to see the big picture. I, I didn't create you to see the big picture. I just want you to take a step. I just want you to go from step one to step two. I just want you to, to move to the next thing that I'm calling you to do. And, and listen, when we do that, it takes an extreme amount of faith to say, God, I can't see what you're doing but I'm going to trust you and I'm, going to just, I'm just going to go to the next thing you're calling me to go to. Here's what I want you to think about this morning. 
Here's, here's the, the statement. Here's what I want you to, to be thinking about this week. When we can't trace God's hand, we need to trust his heart. So, so think about this. Even when we can't trace God's hand, even when we don't know what he's doing or what, what he's trying to accomplish or, or what the big picture is, we need to trust his heart. Even when we can't trace God's hand, we need to trust his heart because he's the creator. And even though we can't see what, 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 the, what the big picture is, we know that the one who created it has a plan and a purpose. And we need to trust him. I don't know about you, but maybe you're here this morning and you feel a little bit like, I, I just don't understand what God's up to. Or maybe you've, you've had that happen in your life. You're like, you've been in the middle of something and you're like, God, I just don't understand. I don't understand why you would allow this to happen. I met with a guy this week who, um, his cancer's back. I sat down with him and, and, and to listen to him think through these things and, and to have these questions of like, God, why, why would you let this happen? God, I don't see the big picture. I don't see why, why you would allow this cancer to come back. God, I don't, I don't understand why you would allow this brokenness in my marriage. God, I don't understand why you would allow this, this unforgiveness to, to be happening in this relationship with a relative. We don't always understand what God's up to. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like, you know what, I think God's forgotten about me. I think God's forgotten about me. I've, it's, been, it's been a week, it's been a month, it's been a year, it's been years of God being silent and God feeling like he's distant and I don't know what he's up to. Well, you are in good company because the people of Israel had experienced this time and time and time again of where they felt like, God, we don't see the big picture. God, we can't trace your hand. But God, we want to trust your heart. That's exactly where the people of Israel were in Exodus chapter 1. It's a moment in the history of God's people where they couldn't trace God's hand. At the end of the book of Genesis, give you a little backstory, a little context. At the end of the book of Genesis, the Hebrews, the, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew nation, uh, had moved to Egypt in the land of Goshen. And, and if, now I was in Egypt last summer, and I'm going to tell you right now, it is one of the most fertile places on, on earth. And so God takes his people, and, and there's drought, and, there, and all of these circumstances, right? We can't trace God's hand. They couldn't see the big picture, but they moved to Egypt so that they could live and survive. And so they come to Egypt, and they're, they're honored guests of Pharaoh. Because of Joseph. Joseph becomes second in command. He brings his family. So the Hebrew nation starts to put down roots in Egypt. And they're starting to call Egypt their home. And years pass. And then a new king shows up. Who didn't know Joseph. Who didn't care about the God of Israel. Who thought that he was a God and thought that he was more important than the God that they were worshiping and following. And here's what he says, this new king, this new pharaoh, he says this, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. And so this new king, this new pharaoh, looks at the people of Israel and he's fearful. He's fearful that, that as they're growing, as they're putting down roots in Egypt, that they're gonna become more powerful and they're gonna fight against Egypt. He's afraid of them. He's threatened by them. He felt that this group of people could, uh, they could pose a problem. They had too much influence, and if that influence is used in the wrong way, then, then it could go really badly for me. And so Pharaoh's plan. So Pharaoh rolls out this plan, and his plan is to enslave the Israelites. And, and maybe for some reason he thought that, that by hard labor, that by whipping them and beating them and making them work uh, till their fingers bled, that, that, they would, that they would just knock the wind out of them. That maybe he thought that by doing that, 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 that working them tirelessly, that they would be too tired to care for their family or even to have a family. That they're like, listen, we're not going to have kids. We don't want to raise our kids in this. Maybe... Maybe he did it because he wanted them to deny their God. 
that he was going to oppress them so much that, that they would deny their God and that they would start following and worshiping the gods of Egypt. Exodus says, Pharaoh's plan backfired. Because Exodus says that the more that they were oppressed, the more that they multiplied. The more, the more that Pharaoh stomped on them, the more that Pharaoh made them work, the more that he, he, he beat them, the more that he oppressed them, it says that the more they multiplied. So Pharaoh turns up the heat. And he rolls out plan B. And so he, he thinks in his mind, if oppression doesn't work, then maybe murder will. And so Pharaoh commands these Jewish midwives in Exodus chapter 1, these Jewish midwives to kill every male child as soon as it's born. And, and, and Pharaoh in his mind is thinking, if, if the Jewish girls end up marrying Egyptians because there's no Israelite men, if the Jewish girls end up marrying Egyptians, I will completely be able to wipe out the Hebrew nation. This is where we meet our unsung heroes of the faith in Exodus chapter 1. Turn with me to verse 15. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. It says this, Then the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall what? You shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, you, she shall live. So Pharaoh rose out this plan. Plan B, right? He's like, here's what we're going to do. We're, gonna, we're just going to take care of all of the males in, in Israel. And we will wipe out the Hebrew nation. These women, I want you to think about this for a second. These women, these midwives, they had given their lives, they had given their lives to bringing life into the world. And now they're being asked to serve as executioners. The king, the pharaoh, gives them a command he gives them a rule. Listen, this is like the government looking at us and saying, you cannot do this, or you have to do this. And so Pharaoh comes in and he says, you will do this. Can you imagine the position that these women were in? They loved, think about this, okay? And some scholars actually say that, that only, the only women that could be midwives were actually women who were barren. So think about this for a second, right? This is their livelihood. These women who can't have children, they get, to, they get to take these children, these babies who are born, and they get to place these newborns in their mother's arms. And this is the joy that they get. They don't get to have children, and yet they get the joy of seeing these mothers hold these children. Can you imagine the position that they were in? as Pharaoh is telling them that they have to execute these male babies. Look at verse 17. Let's see how they respond. Verse 17 says this, but the midwives, what? What's the next word? But the midwives feared who? They feared God. You need to underline that. Listen, that, that is so important in this passage. The midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the male children live. These midwives refused to play a part in the execution of these children. Now listen, I don't, I don't understand all of this, but, but think about this for a second. So the people of Israel are slaves for 400 years, over 400 years. They are slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. Our country is 242 years old. For 400 years, for four centuries, they know pain and abandonment. Think about this. Here's these midwives who are saying, you know what? We've, we've spent 400 years in slavery. We've, felt, we've spent 400 years saying, God, we can't trace your hand. They've spent 400 years saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? 
And in the midst of that abandonment and that hopelessness and that pain, they still feared God. I see people today, Christians today, giving up on God really quick. Something doesn't go our way or something's hurtful or something's painful or, or God allows you to walk through some difficult circumstances and people throw up their hands. Like, why would God let this happen? 400 years, God was silent. 400 years, God left them in slavery and they still feared God. They refused to play a part in the execution of these children. They kept doing what was right, even, even though they knew that it risked the wrath of Pharaoh. Pharaoh could have killed them. Pharaoh could have executed them for not obeying this command. And then Pharaoh calls them in to report on why they had disobeyed. So Pharaoh's like, listen, I still, I still see male Israelites. I still see male babies. What's going on? And he calls them in, which is, which is an, a pretty amazing feet in itself, right? That these Hebrew midwives were called into, they were called in to meet with Pharaoh. And he questions them. Look what he says, verse 18. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and he said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? Why is this still happening? I, I gave you a command. I told you to do something. Why aren't you doing it? Verse 19, the midwives said to Pharaoh, this is interesting, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So here's what they're saying, okay? Now, there's, there's a lot of debate about, did they lie? Did the midwives lie? So we had this conversation as a staff. Did they lie to Pharaoh? So here, here's, as I've studied this, as I've looked at it, I've looked at it from different angles, here's the thing, we don't know. We don't know if they lied. Here's, here's what we do know. Um, Pharaoh gave a command. They disobeyed the command, okay? And then they come to Pharaoh and they, they, they say that these women are vigorous and they don't give birth like the Egyptian pansy ladies. So our, um, our first child, Amelia, um, so uh, Heather goes into labor and we gotta get to the hospital. So... We get to the hospital. From the time Heather went into labor, she started having contractions, to the time that Amelia was born, it was three hours. That's fast, okay? She's a champ. Uh, and, then, and then we start to worry about all the other kiddos. We're like, we better get to the hospital like right now. But here's the thing. So we get to the hospital and we're sitting there waiting Heather's having contractions. She's kind of moving along. And uh, the nurses check her, and the nurses are like, you're dilated to 10. Like, this, this baby's coming. Now, here's, here's the issue. The doctor wasn't there. The doctor wasn't there yet. Our doctor was on, uh, uh, on the other side of town at another hospital delivering twins. And, and so, as you're sitting in there, right, and, and Heather um, is gentle. It's not true. Uh, <laughs> And Heather's like, because, you know, they, they do the whole Lamaze thing, and they're like, you got to get them to relax. And so I'm over there like, Heather, oh, you gotta, just relax, relax. And she's like, you relax. And, uh, and so, so I'm like, I don't know how to do this. This is terrible. Uh, and uh, so, so as all this chaos is happening, right, I can hear the, the nurses chatting. And you know, when, you know when you can, like, you can't really hear what's going on, but you can kind of tell what's going on? Like, it was one of those moments where you were like, something's not right. And, and so these nurses are like, she, the doctor's got to get here. Like, the baby's coming. And, uh, and so the doctor comes, and uh, she comes in the door, and you can, she's just exhausted. She sits down in the chair, and she just sits back. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, get up. And it's those moments, right? It's those moments like, what are you doing? And, and so here's the thing. So these, these uh, Hebrew women... So, so the midwives say, these Hebrew women are vigorous. They're not like the Egyptian wussy women, okay? Like they, they, like they can give birth in the morning and they can be working in the afternoon, all right? And so now, here, here's what I'm saying. 
I don't know if these midwives went to the other midwives and said, listen, if a Hebrew woman who's going into labor calls you, take your time. Just take your time. Because if the baby's born and you're not there, then we're fine. And, and so listen, that may have been the case. We have no indication that they lied. But here's what I want you to think about for a second. We are told, this passage tells us, um, that the midwives feared God. They feared God and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. Now here's what that means. We're, we're not told, we're not told uh, whether the midwives were lying or whether uh, the quick delivery of these Hebrew babies was a biological thing, <laughs> all right? Even if they lied, even if they lied, it's not their deceit that they're commended for. I, I just want you to hear this for a second, okay? Because sometimes people, see, it's okay to lie. Well, Rahab lied, and God blessed her and, and welcomed her into their nation, and, and see, these, these two midwives lied, and like, listen, God is not saying it's okay to lie. God is not commending them. For, so even if they did lie, God's not commending them lying. He's commending their faith. Look what it says, verse 21. And because the midwives lied, is that what it says? What does it say? And because the midwives feared God, because they feared God, not because they lied, not because they were being deceitful, not because they made up a story, not be, listen, it's because they feared God. They trusted God enough to do what was right. They engaged in what we would call civil disobedience, okay? And I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be political here. But, but listen, if, if the government says that you have to do something that goes against God's word, okay, which authority is higher? God's, all the time. So if the government says you can't do this or you have to do this, okay, and God's word says no, you should do that or you shouldn't do that, then we follow God's law. And we see it all throughout scripture. We see it all throughout human history. It's called civil disobedience. Anytime that we obey God rather than the law, whether it's written or unwritten, we engage in civil disobedience. Listen, if we don't stand up for what's right and godly, who will? If we as followers of Jesus Christ don't stand up for what God cares about, who will? Someone once said, I thought this was interesting, someone once said, all that is needed for culture to destroy itself the only thing that's needed for society to implode, the only thing that's needed for society to destroy itself is for God's people to do nothing. God has given us a responsibility to stand up for what is right. And that's what these two midwives did. They got a command. They, they got a command from Pharaoh himself, the king himself, that they were to execute these male children, and they stood up to that, and they said, no, we will not do it. Acts chapter 5, you remember the story in Acts chapter 5? The disciples, right? So Jesus is leaving the earth, and he commands his disciples. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the good news. And so they go out, and they fulfill God's command, right? They go out and they start preaching the gospel. They're going through the streets and they're talking about Jesus. And the religious leaders, they thought they, thought they were done with this whole charade. They were like, we killed Jesus, it's done, it's, it's done. And yet here these disciples are and they're starting to raise up this, this insurrection again. And so they pull the disciples aside and, and they say, listen, you want to spend the night in jail? They're like, yeah, we'd love to. We, got, we need a place to sing, it's got good acoustics, Right? You know the story, right? And they start singing in the jail cell and the doors open and they walk out. And where did they go? They went into hiding. Is that what they did? No, where did they go? 
They went back to the streets. They went back to the streets preaching the gospel, even though they got thrown into jail. So they pull them in again and they say, listen, if you don't stop talking about the guy, they won't even say his name. Like, if you don't stop preaching this, if you don't stop talking about this, we will kill you. And what does Peter say? Oh, we're, we're sorry. We actually, we didn't know that it was that serious. No, that's not how he responds. Peter steps up and he says, listen, here's the thing. We're going to continue to do what God told us to do. You judge whether it's right for us to obey you rather than God. Slap on the wrist. Let them go. And they continued to preach the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I don't know what your situation is right now. I don't know what thing is going on in your life that you feel like, man, there's just this moral decision. There's this thing at work. There's this thing in my home. There's this thing in our culture and our society. But listen to me. You have to obey God above all things. That's what it means to be people of faith. That we trust God no matter the consequences. Here's my last thought that I want you to um, take away. Fear is essential to faith. That seems weird, but I want you to think about this for a second. Fear is essential to faith. Who did Pharaoh fear? Who did Pharaoh fear? He was afraid of the Israelites. He, he was afraid that they were, that they were going to get too large. He was afraid that their influence was actually going to go against Egypt and not for Egypt. He, he was afraid of the Israelites. So Pharaoh is afraid of the Israelites and he devises a wicked plan that fails. The midwives, who did they fear? They feared God. These midwives fear God and they devise a plan for good, to rescue, to save, to give life, and their plan succeeds. Now you tell me who you want to fear. In Luke chapter 12, as the worship team comes up, I want you to hear these words from Luke chapter 12. Some of the most, honestly, as I, as I read these words, these are frightening words. Some of the most frightening words in the New Testament. Luke chapter 12, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. So, so Jesus has been preaching. Uh, he's, been, he's been sort of um, upsetting what the religious leaders have been doing. And, and, and so Jesus is preaching, and, and he's probably getting threats, right? And, and I love, and in, in maybe in your Bible it has a little, uh, uh, a little heading on there. Just so you know, those headings aren't inspired, okay? That's somebody else's thought of like, hey, here's the title for this section of scripture. But, but in your Bible, maybe it says something like this, have no fear, right? Have no fear. And all throughout scripture, we hear these words, don't be afraid, fear not. Over and over and over again, God tells us not to be afraid, except in this passage. So this, this shouldn't be have no fear, this should, this should be place your fear in the right place. Put your fear in the right thing. Because look what he says. Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he says, listen, I know we've been getting death threats, right? But, but I want you guys to know, my friends, he says this, red letters, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. Do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. See, listen, there's people that could take your life. There's people that could take your life in a second. There's people that could throw you in jail. There's people that, listen, there's, there, anybody can do that. But once you're dead, they can't do anything to you. And Jesus says this, but I will warn you. He sits down with him. He gets right down with him. He says, look at me. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. But I will warn you whom to fear. 
You need to fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. And then he adds this, yes, I tell you, fear him. Now listen, Jesus isn't talking about like being afraid of God, being scared of God. Jesus is talking about a respect for God, a reverence for God that he can do, listen, he can do whatever he wants. And if you don't have a fear of God in you, then you will never be able to walk by faith. Fear is essential to faith. These women, these women did what was right. These women, even in the face of death, even in the face of punishment, they did what was right. Because why? Because they feared God and not man. Daniel prays three times a day. He's told not to. If anybody's found praying, they're thrown into the lion's den. Listen, we these little cute stories. Listen, this is people living out civil disobedience and saying, it is my responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ to obey God and not man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Peter. Throughout human history, I love the end of that passage in Luke chapter 12. Jesus, he gives an example. He's like, are, are, fi- are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? I don't even know what he's talking about. But look what he says. And not one of them is forgotten before God. God cares about you. God values you. You are significant to him. You mean everything to him. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. So he says, listen, don't be afraid of people who can kill you and then that's it. Be afraid of God. Fear God. Respect God. Revere God. And then he comes back and he's like, listen, if you fear God, guess what? You don't have to fear anything. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. God wants you to know that this morning. That fear of him is essential to faith. When you cannot trace God's hand, you need to trust his heart. When you can't see the big picture, when you don't understand what's going on, when you feel like God's abandoned you, when you feel like you don't have any answers, when you feel like somebody's telling you to do something or forcing you to do something that you know goes against what God wants, you need to trust God. Even if it costs you, it costs you your job, it costs you a relationship, you do what God is commanding you to do. God blessed these women because they feared him. I want you to see this at the end. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them family. These women who were barren, these women who couldn't have children, these women who spent their entire life living vicariously through other women, handing these newborn children and seeing the joy on these mothers' faces. And God, because they feared him more than they feared Pharaoh, God gave them families. He gave them their own newborns to hold. Now here's here's what's so amazing. Because they feared God and they walked by faith, God's people are still here today. Listen, Moses would have never have been born. Right? Moses, superhero of faith, standing on top of a skyscraper with a cape. Moses, right? Red Sea, staff in the hand, thing parts. Listen, he wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for these two women. What's God asking you to do today? What's God asking you to trust him with today? You may not be able to trace God's hand, but you can trust his heart, I promise you. Father, we come before you this morning, and God, we want to trust you.
God, I know that there's people here this morning. God, I know because I know their stories. God, I know that there's people here this morning that want to just scream because they're in so much pain, physically and emotionally. God, I know there's people in here this morning that are broken. God, I know, God, I know for a fact that there's people in here this morning that are waiting for an answer. God, they've been waiting for a while for you to answer their prayer. They've been waiting for a while for you to to restore a relationship. And God, in the midst of all that's going through their mind right now at this very moment, of, of the connect the dots and thinking, God, just show me the big picture. Just give me a glimpse of what, of what you're doing. God, we're reminded this morning that your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And God, with that truth this morning, we want to trust you. And so God, I pray, I, God, I want to breathe that into those people this morning we're struggling and walking through these difficulties. God, I want to breathe. I want to breathe faith into them this morning. They would be able to trust you. And so, Lord, as we sing this last song, God, would this be a declaration that you are worthy, that you're worthy of everything that we have. You're worthy of our respect. You're worthy of our honor. You're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our lives. So, God, we... We want to respond to you this morning and just say, God, we trust you. We trust you with our future, with our family, with our jobs, with our kids. God, we trust you with everything.